In this video, we create a new instance. The software has been installed. An instance is needed for the data to be extracted from IWS and delivered to the connector and ultimately AI. We'll configure the instance in another video. In this video, we explore the A option for add. The end results will be an empty shell with basic settings, the IWS subsystem, the AI instance ID, and a color theme. We'll show the system elements added to ZOS and USS. Additional items will also be added to CUSLib and we'll explain what they do. Finally, we'll show how to start an instance. The process is fairly simple but has multiple parts that we outline. Let's create our first instance. We see the four options A, C, U, and M, which match the four options we outline in the overview. We use option A for add. Some of the slots are already taken, so we select one of the available ones. It should be clear that when starting the IMS for the first time, no instance is defined. The IMS will automatically start the add instance function to define the first instance. The A add option is therefore only used when defining more instances within the same IMS. We're in the first screen of the add option. Here we enter the baseline settings of our instance, but we're not configuring yet, that comes next. You have to enter the IWS subsystem. The software populates the LPAR automatically in its reserve fields, although we'll be able to customize this later. Then we add the AAI system ID. Assuming you have experience installing AAI on a Unix or Windows system, you'll remember this three character ID in the wizards. We enter it here. Both IWS subsystem and AAI ID are important. They're going to define the naming convention of the instance members, and so we have to get it right. We can change the menu slots. We name our software instance, and this is your decision, although we recommend establishing a naming convention early, so as to maintain consistency throughout the system. We then have the option of setting a color theme to our environments, for the instance name, the LPAR, and so forth. In the next screen, we allocate datasets. They require an HLQ. The default option lets you enter a high-level HLQ and the software appends the rest. The reason we emphasize the importance of IWS subsystem and AI instance ID is this. When the instance's datasets are created in ZOS, the default naming convention of the HLQ uses the following. First, a fixed value, AIST dot. Then the AI instance ID. Then the last character of the IWS subsystem, then LPAR dot, and finally the dataset name. AAI server ID name and IWS subsystem were entered in the previous screen. Then we have the ZOS system settings, management class, storage class, data class, volume serial, and so forth. We have to set the name of the ZFS volume that will host the data files prior to transmission to AAI. Use override DSN to define an alternative name if site standards require vSAM clusters specific HLQs. If you leave it blank, the default ZFS volume name is shown in yellow. If you override, you specify DNS and space. We also allocate the space based on the size of the IWS system and volume of data we're expecting to acquire. We're not going to expand on these fields, but as always, sizing is important and you should carefully review the documentation. We press enter to continue, the datasets are created. This is reflected in ZOS. We now have these new datasets. Let's describe the important ones. Here are the datasets of notes. SRVR SCFG stores instance configurations, in other words, the information pertaining to the instance. Since we haven't configured, it's currently empty. SRVR SREG stores request codes issued from the ISP FIMS system or the request STC. These codes are four characters, say term or ADEF. SRVR SREC also contains the state of the primary STC, say active, shut down, or busy. This makes it possible for the IMS system and the request STC to know whether they can issue requests to the server STC in the first place. SRVR CKPT is the checkpoint. It stores the date and timestamp of the last event date send. Following warm start, it can recover all of the data since the checkpoint date and time, and up to the current date and time to make sure nothing is missing. The CUSLib library has been appended with items dedicated to the management of the instance. The important ones are as follows. A control member called AIST IMCF, which has specific information about each instance. A JCL named AIST followed by four characters based on the AAI ID and IWS subsystem. 
which starts the server STC, and AITR, which starts the request STC. It also has CPOP followed by the same four characters based on the IWS subsystem and AAIID. This initiates the current plan file delivery. Let's take a minute to talk about the startup procedure. Up until this point, we've been discussing the server STC, the information sourced in ZOS, and the processes that run in USS. The instant start procedure uses elements from both. This is an LPAR with two IWS subsystems, IWS 1 and 2. We have two software instances and AI servers, each with an ID as well, 1, 2, 3, and XYZ. We've already described what these IDs are. When a software instance is installed, new JCLs are added to Cuslib for the management of that instance. AITS, which is the server STC, and AITR, which is the request STC whose purpose is to submit commands to SRVR SREC, followed by four characters. Their naming is automated. The instance procedure is a JCL called AITS, followed by four characters, the three AAI instance ID, and the last character of the IWS subsystem name. As a result, the first JCL is called AITS1231, while the second, AITS XYZ2. To start the instance, we simply execute this JCL. It invokes BPX batch and starts the USS environments. It also passes a Unix executable, AIST SRVR, which is the server STC code. The instance starts. This is the Cuslib member where the execution JCL can be found. It must be copied to a system procedure library. This is the default generated name for the server STC based on the instance code XXXY, which you would specify to automation so it starts automatically. The important section is this statement. It describes the execution of the PGM BPX batch, invoking the AIST SRVR execution module passed as a parameter. 